Hello, it's four o'clock. We're ready to get started. Four o'clock Eastern, three o'clock Central. Uh, my name is Kehlani Dunsmore. I'm the director of the Literacy Organizational Capacity Initiative, a project at NRC at the University of Chicago. We are sponsoring, along with the Consortium for Educational Change, this wonderful webinar series focusing on social emotional learning and really bringing thought leadership to you from across the country and our, with our goal to build the expertise of teachers and educators and principals in how to integrate and thoughtfully develop curriculum and practices that that really attend to the social emotional learning of students in support of cognitive development. We're really delighted to present today uh, a, a session by Peter Brunn. He's with the Center for Collaborative Classrooms in California. It's a nonprofit organization. You may be familiar with their curriculum and materials and development. Peter uh, at CCC leads the organization's work with schools and districts across the country fostering students' academic, social, and ethical development. You may be familiar from hearing his keynotes or presentations at a number of local, state, and national conferences, including NCPE, Learning Forward, ILA. Uh, more recently, he's been a keynote speaker at conferences uh, sponsored by the Virginia ASCD, Virginia and Georgia Association of Elementary School Principals. Peter brings classroom experience. He was a teacher in New York. Uh, then he began his uh, work uh, after, uh, after as a teacher working at uh, the College Reading and Writing Project at Columbia University. He has a book out that uh, many of you may be familiar with, Lesson Planning Handbook, Essential Strategies that Inspire Students' Thinking and Learning. He now lives in California with his wife and daughter. Um, and he is coming all the way from California time then to those of us who are on the east and and central time zone to really share some best practices and expertise in thinking about integrating and strategies for integrating social, emotional, academic development. I want to just give you a few little tips for this webinar. At the bottom, you'll see a chat box. We encourage you to chat your questions in it. Uh, Mary uh, Tavigia, who is from the Consortium for Educational Change, is monitoring that space. She herself brings a great deal of expertise in social and emotional learning. She wrote the Illinois Learning Standards for Social and Emotional Learning, has been a longtime educator in the public school system as well as a consultant. So she'll be monitoring the chat space and bringing up questions for discussion with Peter, but she'll also be responding to them as well. So we're really excited for the presentation today. You'll notice that we have muted uh, your, your screen and your videos. We can unmute it as we go along, but we really expect you to use the chat space to ask your questions. So, so thank you for joining it, and I'm going to turn this over now to uh, Peter and Mary. Thank you. All right. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Um, Mary, I think I'm just going to get started, if that makes sense. That's great. Thanks, Peter. Okay, great. So I see there's lots of folks from Elgin, um, or at least a few folks from Elgin, and I've done lots of work at Elgin, so maybe I know some of you. Um, it's good to, uh, it's great to be here from sunny now California. When I was running this morning in the rain, it did not feel so sunny, but um, certainly warmer than where I think most of, uh, most of, most of you all are right now. Um, I am super excited. Let me just share my screen um, to get into our conversation today. So um, I'm just going to get started. Um, I don't know how many of you have run across me before or our organization. Um, certainly, uh, we are, uh, I'll just say a little bit about us so you can put us in the world of education and you can sort of frame me in your worldview. Um, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. We've been around for about 38 years. Um, and really, um, when I think about our mission and I think about our work in schools, you know, we're really, when, when I think about the children that we serve and the people that we need them to become, you know, the caretakers of ourselves, the caretakers of our democracy, um, we think that um, if they're going to become those people, they're going to need some very specific and very intentional skills. And, and, and really for us, that makes up what a collaborative classroom is. So we really help schools and teachers across the country build collaborative classrooms so kids can grow into the kind of people we need them to be. And we do that through a couple different ways. We do it through uh, lots of professional development for schools and districts. 
but um, also importantly through our curriculum. We really see curriculum as a vehicle for teacher learning. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today, matter of fact, all of what I'm gonna talk about today has come from my really 18 years experience at this organization, um, learning alongside teachers and supporting schools and districts and trying to build collaborative classrooms. So we've been thinking uh, uh, in our organization very deeply about the integration of academic and social development, about social emotional learning. And I'm gonna spend some time today really unpacking that with you all. So uh, I'm super excited to be here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I, I, I was trying to figure out the best way to frame this. So, so you all could sort of take away a, a some building blocks of how to think about instruction. And I think what I'm gonna to do today, some of what I'm gonna do is gonna confirm what many of you already do and all of key things. Um, I call them core principles. Um, you might call them guiding principles. They certainly have, are, are the, um, the, the, the vision on which that we build our curriculum and all of our teacher developments uh, work that we do. Um, and so what I'm going to read them aloud right now. So they're going to come out and I'm going to read aloud these four things and you can um, think about which of these most resonates with you as I read them. So the first principle of when we think about a, a collaborative classroom is fostering caring relationships and building inclusive and safe environments are foundational practices for both the student and adult learning communities. So that's one. Another one is classroom learning experiences should be built around students constructing knowledge and engaging in action. The next one, honoring and building on students' intrinsic motivation leads to engagement and achievement. And then the last one, the social and academic curriculum are independent and integrated. And I suppose if I were to ask you to think about which of these most resonates with you, um, there would be one on this list that you think, right, that's super important. Yeah, they're all important, but like for right now in my own practice, one is really important. Um, and then I, if I were to reverse the question and say, well, which one of these is the most challenging? Think about right now, which one for you might be the most challenging of these? And my guess is some of you would pick the same one, but my guess also is that um, many of you would, would, would move to, to a slightly different one. Maybe, for instance, your school has done a lot of work around uh, integrating academic and social development, but, um, but motivation remains a fundamental issue because, you know, I teach adolescents or I, uh, uh, whatever it is that, that you know, um, that's happening for you. So, um, but, but when I ask you those two questions, it's really a false force choice because in many ways, uh, they are all very integrated and very interdependent. Um, I, I, I don't think, you know, there's sort of like four, uh, four legs to a stool. Um, and that, that, that really without the four of these, in our experience, um, that, 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 that we struggle um, if, we don't, if all of these sort of aren't in place. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna break this down. I'm actually gonna get into thinking about each of these. And um, I'm gonna talk about them in not a really specific order, like one's more important than the other, but I think that, that um, for me, um, it's easier to build as I go through this order. So this is the order I'm gonna talk about them. And the first one I wanna talk about is um, this one. And, um, and what that fundamentally means when we wanna focus on relationships is that they matter. Uh, I think um, that can be a trite statement. People can say, you know, oh, of course relationships matter. Um, but, but when I think about the importance of relationships, um, both in my own practice, but also in our experience at schools, but also in my own life, I, 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 and then I come to recognize how vitally important it is. I mean, we have a whole industries of people in the world, counselors, um, we have uh, uh, we have um, uh, therapists, we have marriage counselors, we have lawyers, <laughs> we have all kinds of whole fields and industries around helping us sort of with our own relationships. So relationships aren't easy, but they fundamentally matter. And I wanna talk about a few things the way at least our organization has thought about it. Um, one is, um, we, when we think about relationships, I like to talk about either two things, one, a sense of connectedness or a sense of community. Um, 
And one of the things our organization um, spent a long time studying was the impact that sense of community had on students. And we found out a whole host of things that mattered when we think about relationships. We, we and on the left-hand column here are some of the studies that we conducted. We did some in St. Louis, San Francisco, but we also did a massive six district study um, uh, where we looked at this idea of sense of connectedness. And here's what we found. We found that when, uh, uh, when students, when schools, intentionally built relationships with kids and when students reported they felt a high sense of community that they did better in school um, that probably doesn't surprise you right um, uh, the, the, but but their academic achievement was higher um, the, their pro-social tendencies I, you know what that really means is their concern for others um, was greater they um, there was less misbehavior in school so kids act, acted out less something else that we found was they came to school more so when a student feels a strong sense of community, they actually come to school more. Um, but this is interesting, this, 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 the second to last bullet. Um, and, and that is that when we followed kids who experienced a strong sense of community in elementary school, when we followed them to middle school, one of the things that we found was that even though we didn't focus on uh, drugs, alcohol, or tobacco, that there was a dramatic decrease among kids who helped, who experienced and felt a high sense of community with their alcohol, drug, and um, uh, uh, misuse. And, and what that says to me is that when kids experience a strong sense of community, they take care of themselves better. And actually, that was bared out in another big research study, and this is uh, the last of my big research that I'm gonna share with you. Um, uh, but the idea, Michael Resnick, who you may know the study, it's a pretty famous study in the Journal of America, uh, in the America, Journal of American Medical Association. Um, he looked at like 12,000 adolescents. And one of the things that he found out was indeed the same things that we found that in elementary and middle school were true in high school. That kids did better, they, um, but they took care of themselves. They used drugs, alcohol, and tobacco less. They were less violent. They experienced less um, emotional distress. And they had sex later. They delayed sexual entry. And again, you know, um, uh, what that means to me is that they, get, they do better in school, but they also take care of themselves. And um, the other thing I want to say about um, this idea of um, building relationships is two big things. One is the, we're gonna, we ask kids to do some very rigorous work. Right, we're asking kids to, to think deeply. We want them to take risks. And they can't do that in an environment where they don't feel safe to take those risks. They feel like they're going to be laughed at, they feel like they're gonna be labeled as wrong, if they're gonna be labeled smart. Um, it's, it's very difficult for kids to thrive and to work hard and to fail and to try again if they're not in an environment that supports that. So that's one really massive thing I think that is true and certainly been true in my work. But the other thing is any culturally responsive pedagogy where we are looking at our own biases, where we're trying to be responsive to the needs of everyone in our community. But if you look at anyone, whether you look at um, Zaretta Hammond's work, um, uh, 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 Sonia Nieto's work, all of those pedagogies start with the idea that we've got to build relationships, that, you, that without a sense of trust, a deep sense of trust, and a deep connection, that all the other work we're gonna do is not gonna be as powerful. And in fact, might not even actually happen. So, so when I think about a collaborative classroom, um, the first thing I start with is a uh, is, is sense of community. So, then that, that, so if I feel a strong sense of community and then I think about, all right, well, what are, what are the other things that matter? Um, the next thing that, that comes to my mind is this interdependence of the academic and social curriculum. Um, you know, in my mind, they have equal weight. And in our curriculum, typically, when we're thinking about supporting teachers, when I tell teachers plan lessons, um, I want them to think about a social curriculum and I want them to think about academic curriculum and I want to think about them together. Um, because uh, we really can't do one without the, out the other. If you think of um, your, uh, if you think of the interdependence with which um, uh, learning occurs, 
Um, for instance, if, uh, if I'm reading a piece of text or, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to dig into this piece of text and I have a theory about what's happening, um, my theory is stronger when I have to defend that to somebody else. Or when somebody else says to me, I don't think I agree with you. When I read this piece of text, I thought blank. And then I've got a decision to make. That, 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 that the skills, the social skills I need to be able to talk to somebody else, to weigh evidence, to listen carefully, to disagree appropriately, all those social skills are fundamental to my, uh, to my, to my deep thinking um, and to my eventual learning. And so it's, 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 it's vitally important that we think about them together. The other thing I wanted to say was I was, in, I was just in some schools. So I was in a school in Reno um, just uh, not long ago. Um, uh, was it last week? It might have been the last week. And one of the things we were working on um, was nonfiction writing. And um, so the unit that the, 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 was a fourth grade class, and one of the things that the um, teachers were working on was they were writing this, these expository nonfiction pieces, and kids had done a lot of research. And they were, they were sort of towards the end of the research cycle, and they'd already done a lot of drafting, and they were getting ready to publish their pieces. But what they had done was they had written these pieces in pairs. So she had upped the social challenge by having kids construct these arguments and these nonfiction pieces in pairs where each kid had um, responsible for different sections. They had to figure out how to construct it. Um, they had to do the research together. There's a whole host of sort of social challenges, as you can imagine, that are um, broken down in this. And one of the things I was doing with them was we were having them look at their drafts to make some final, um, uh, to make some final decisions, both on the lead. So they were supposed to look at sort of how they started the piece and see if it was the best way to start it. Did it hook the reader? Did it do the things, especially in a nonfiction piece that they wanted it to do? And then they had to look for a few other things that, uh, in, 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 the bed, in, the, in the body of their papers. And what we noticed when we, did the, when we looked at the research, and I had teacher researchers in the room with me, is when we looked at what, what the kids actually did, some of the kids' partners were absent. So about, there was a class of about 33 kids, I think, and six kids' partners were absent. So we had, we had, we had like, you know, I don't know, uh, 12 pairs um, that were functioning, and then we had some outliers. We had kids that, that didn't have partners. And so they were just looking at their drafts on their own. And so then we looked at the rigor of the work that the partnerships did versus the work that the, um, the individuals did when they looked at their drafts, and it was dramatically different what actually happened. The, even and it, and it was regardless of whether kids were sort of high achieving kids or not high achieving kids, because the, both groups had both of those kids in them. What we noticed was that when kids had partners, the rigor of their thinking was very, very different. So when we coded the language the kids were using, when we looked at the actual decisions they made in the text, when we looked at how they were referring to the text in their conversations, all the, the sort of intellectual hard work that the kids were doing as writers came clear when they had a partner. When they were working uh, independently, they made very surface level decisions. Um, they, they did it quickly. Um, they spent less time on task. It was really interesting. And what that says to me, it just reiterates to me that learning, you know, um, our best learning happens in community and we need skills to be able to do that. Um, and so that, so when I think of social and academic skills, we think of teaching both of them. So at the beginning of a lesson, I want to, I want to ask kids, so what do we need today to be successful? And it may be that I know that, for instance, one of the things that we've been working on is agreeing and disagreeing respectfully. So one of the things I'm, I'll say is, you know, we've been working on this idea of agreeing and disagreeing respectfully. We're going to look at another piece of text today. What are some of the things we need to remember from the last time we talked? And at the end of the lesson, I want to revisit that and say, so how do we do today? Where did we struggle? Um, uh, wh what was easy and what was hard. Um, and so we have a curriculum that sort of emerges from that talk. And a lot of you have done work on accountable talk. If you've done work sort of thinking about it, you know, as if you've looked at the Common Core Standards, many of you have looked at some of the, 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 the literacy work that kids have to do to be able to justify their thinking, whether it's mathematics or whether it's literacy. Um, all this work obviously comes to play there because without a safe community, without those social skills, we're fundamentally left bereft, and we've got um, we're sort of uh, rudderless if we don't have those uh, those those skills guiding us. And one of my fears is that you know schools, when they think of social emotional learning, 
we think, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to adopt a curriculum, a social emotional learning curriculum. that's going to sort of solve those needs for me. And then I'm going to just teach in the old way that I've been teaching. And what I've come to recognize is that, you know, if you're going to build a truly collaborative classroom, those, that those social skills and those the social emotional skills that kids need to thrive have to be embedded in the work, have to be relevant to the work, or it becomes a bit of an extra. It can be, some, it can be something that I, that I can push off for tomorrow because it's not as fundamental as the stuff I've got to get done today. And that's what I mean when I think about, um, when I think about integration. Mary, I'm going to pause for a second there. Um, what, were, there were there questions that people had in the chat? Is there anything that, 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 is it that, that I need to, um, do you want to raise? Uh, we, you know, someone just brought up the fact that all these social emotional skills and the things that you've been talking about tend to fade away now as we have technology in kids' hands. And I think that's an interesting topic to, uh, to talk about for a minute. Well, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, I mean, the whole idea of personalized learning. I mean, uh, um, if you look at, I'm, I'm not going to, I won't be able to quote this statistic exactly, but one of the things we were just looking at in our organization was the amount of money that venture capitalists had poured into startups um, uh, that do personalized learning. It is massive. Um, it is the most invested in educational um, technology uh, that is out there. And, 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 and if, it, and I, of course, I'm not far from Silicon Valley. And so, you know, a lot of those investors are, <laughs> are my neighbors. Um, and, and, uh, but what, one of the things I, that, that brings to mind is that there, it's coming, that this isn't going to stop. Um, it is, it is a whole army of, of, of things that we're going to get blasted with. And some of them are going to be probably good and some of them will be very bad. Um, but the idea uh, that um, we think that the more kids work independently on information that's tailored to their specific need or skill and to think that that learning can occur in a vacuum is probably pretty wrongheaded. And we're going to have um, a great deal of evidence, I think, as we look at the data from what's happening in our classrooms that, um, that, that an overemphasis now, I said overemphasis um, on personalized learning or on sort of gamification of classrooms or, uh, you know, putting us on sort of individual devices um, can have an unintended uh, consequence, which is kids actually don't develop the academic skills they need to be successful. I mean, one of the things, actually, I, I, I love this quote here. It's um, uh, at least I'm in Adal. I stole this from her. She's the, the director of the National Writing Project. Um, and at one of the one of our meetings, she said to me, um, you know, uh, we hire on the hard skills, but we fire on the soft skills. <laughs> um, and of course, and I, I don't think they're actually soft skills at all. I think they're all very hard skills. <laughs> but what this means to me is that, you know, like I think um, in my organization, you know, I, I don't hire any people who don't come from great schools, who don't have great degrees, who aren't super, super smart, who don't have, you know, experience. But not all those people survive. And it's not because they're not smart or they don't have skills that they don't survive. Typically, where they, it's because they're struggling working with one another, working on a team, getting feedback, accepting feedback, being able to give feedback to others, um, being able to grow work, being able to manage multiple projects with multiple people on them. Those things are really, really hard. When I went back to the example of kids who had to do that writing project a little, a little while ago, I mean, um, it's not that those kids, those kids did a lot, you know, technology was a key piece of the, the research they collected, of the information they gathered, and of, the, of what, how they displayed what they knew. Some of them created blogs, some of them were creating websites, um, some of them were writing articles, it sort of depended. But my point isn't that technology is unimportant. But the idea is we've got to think about its use and how that, 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 that it can be a tool for kids to, to, to be successful and to grow. And so I think that's why I like this quote. And I think it's sort of an interesting way to, to talk about that. That's, that's great, Peter. And as you go on, um, would you just think a little bit about addressing the issue of class size? That's something else that came up, that large classes make it hard to build community. It's interesting that you were in uh, the school, you were in the classroom had 33 students. That's a large class. But yeah, and I, I know that there are classes that are bigger. <laughs> Um, and I think it's, just a, it's a really, um, it's a hard and an important question. Um, I think um, now's probably a good place to at least touch on it. 
um, because I think that when I think about um, all classes, not just big classes, but even, even, you know, more modestly sized classes of something, you know, 20 to 25 or something like that, which I think is sort of a modestly sized classroom. Um, uh, I, I tend to think that I try to want, I want to try to reduce the size of the classroom um, as much as I can. Um, and what I mean by that is I tend to use a ton of different cooperative structures and, and um, breaking kids up into small and big groups and whole class and small class. Um, and, um, and I make those an integral part of our lessons. So when I think about lesson design, I'm thinking about opportunities for kids to work both in small groups, in pairs. I think pairs is a, I mean, we, I, I think it's fundamental to the work. Um, and they're gonna need skills to manage those things so we can feel confident that when they get in a group of three or four, that one, someone isn't siloed or you know, isn't, isn't uh, sort of um, on the side and watching or passive. Um, you know, we want to, and I'll talk in a little while about engagement. Um, engagement is going to be fundamental to any of this really happening. Um, and I actually think that we think about engagement um, because when you have big classes, what you need is a lot of engagement because kids are going to have to work in, in situations where you're not right in front of them and you're not going to be able to hear every conversation that they have as a teacher. And that sort of means to me that we have to have um, uh, deep and meaningful relationships and they have to build them with each other. And they have to build them with with uh, with um, with me with me. Um, I think that we also want to make it safe for kids to make mistakes. And what I mean by that is, you know, I look at behavior when I think about behavior in, in big classes. You know, if you think of misbehavior, kids sort of acting out because they're bored or they they don't think the teacher can see them. Um, um, I, you know, I, I tend to set kids up so that I, they, they will make mistakes. Like I want to set kids up in partnerships that are challenging for them. I know that sometimes they're going to be in a partnership with someone they don't like. I know that sometimes they're going to be in a partnership with somebody who um, disagrees with them. Um, I know they're going to be in a partnership where someone does all the talking. Um, I have that experience in my own work. <laughs> um, I've got to deal with it. Um, and, 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 the, and it's how I deal with it that actually matters. And so I don't want kids to feel like they're labeling somebody or they're calling somebody out they say you know my partner you know we didn't get along today we're really struggling um, i i tend to think that that, that that i want to i want it to be safe enough for them to say that and then for them to know that the goal for our work is to talk about that and to figure out all right, so what are we going to do tomorrow um what will it look like tomorrow if it's if you know what's it like to work with somebody who you're not really friends with um you know as kids get older you know they have relationships you know Heaven forbid you've got a boyfriend and a girlfriend that have recently broken up and they're partners in your classroom. Um, you, we all know what that looks like. Um, uh, and, um, but, but the fact of the matter is kids need the skills and they need practice at doing these things. And it's hard. And so I want to give kids lots of chances to do that. And that goes to the last thing I'll say about big classes is, you know, oftentimes team builders are something we do at the beginning of the year and we don't do them throughout the whole course of the year. And as we get in the middle and high school, sometimes we don't do them at all. And I would argue that anytime I can build team building into the work of my class, I will do it. Um, and I won't stop at September. You know, I think that is a year long process. Look, I mean, I, I've been married to my wife now for what, um, 18 years. And I still am working at being a good husband. I'm still working at being a good listener. Um, so I tend to think that we um, want to continue to help our students take that lens to our students. I want to give them lots of opportunities to grow. They, like me, are going to make lots of mistakes. And we want to just make sure we've got a mechanism for talking about it and, 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 and integrating it into the instruction where it matters so that it's not an extra, so that I don't feel like the team building that I'm doing is something that I've got to get to the hard stuff. Like I, I need to figure out how, you know, sometimes reading and talking about a really good book or a really important book, or a film, or a, a vignette from YouTube. Some of those bring us together too. Those can be acts of team building. So maybe we need even just to expand that a little bit. The next thing that I wanted to talk about was this idea of um, classroom learning experiences being built around students constructing knowledge and engaging in action. And here, what, um, what I'm talking about is uh, kids have to do the work. And in many classrooms that I 
and I get a chance um, to visit lots. And when you write a book called The Lesson Planning Handbook, every principal wants you to plan lessons with their teachers. And so you spend lots of time planning lessons, observing lessons. Um, uh, uh, and I will tell you that one of the biggest um, things that I see is that um, when I take a stopwatch, and I'll do this with teachers that I coach, and I'll have them record the number of minutes down to the second the kids spend reading, writing, or talking with each other around a topic. Um, and then looking at the day's minutes and comparing the two. And, um, and then a bigger one is to look at those minutes and compare it to how much time the teacher is talking. And that data often tells us that as teachers, you know, what we, we talk a lot. Sometimes we talk too much. Um, we've designed lessons that are centered around us disseminating knowledge in such a way that, that we're trying to push so much content out that um, we end up doing a lot of the thinking and talking for kids. So one of the things I try to get teachers to do is to rethink about lesson planning in a way to think about lesson, um, uh, designing lesson experiences. So what does that mean to create an experience, a learning experience for a kid versus me teach a lesson to a kid? Um, I can take the same content, the same objective, but how do I flip it so the kids are doing the work? Um, and because the, 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 the thing that is hard to remember and maybe is the most disempowering thing about being a teacher is to recognize that we're not actually in charge of what's, what gets learned. The kids are. They decide, actually, what gets learned. They're the arbiter of um, all that. It's their des desire and their decision and their engagement sort of makes that happen. Um, all we can do is create the, the opportunity for that to happen. And so it can be kind of disempowering because just because I taught it doesn't mean they learned it. Um, and, and so this, there's this real dichotomy in here between sort of um, what, what kids need to do what I need to cover, and there's always going to be a tension there. There's always going to be a tension there, no matter what, um, or how much time we have in the day, whether we have, you know, more and more um, uh, uh, time during the year. If we had, you know, we expanded school year, we would, time would always be an issue, and there'd always be a tension between what we have to cover and the amount of time we have to cover it. But I would argue that the time kids spend doing matters the most, because that's where they're constructing knowledge. Um, and, 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 and for me, that's also what I, when I talked about behavior earlier, that's what I want to do when I think about behavior. You know, I want kids, I want to watch them doing, acting, making mistakes. Uh, I, I want to set them in social situations that are uncomfortable, that force them to have to um, include someone they might not have wanted included before, or, they, or maybe they don't have skills to include somebody. Um, what does that look like? How do you engage someone in that kind of conversation? Um, and in the reading and writing, I want to make sure I set it up so that it's not, you know, like uh, one of the things that, like if I'm teaching somebody the, the skill of, um, of making inferences, like inferring is such a big, deep, meaningful skill that, 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 that readers, not just young, but also readers old, have to do and engage in. Um, but one of the things I do is I often just pass out a text that um, instead of doing a think aloud, instead of me doing sort of telling them what, a, what an inference is, um, I will pass out a piece of text that um, re actually requires them to make an inference. Um, one text that comes to mind, you know, is um, uh, The Sweetest Fig by Chris Van Allsburg. I don't know if you guys, I'm not sure many of you know that book. Um, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a scene in there where Ms. the, the one of the main, the main character, he's clearly an evil guy. I think he's a bad dude. Um, and it's clear to the reader eventually that this guy is not nice, but the author actually never says that. So one of the things I ask kids, I would ju I just read the book. We'll just read it out loud or I'll have them read it depending on you know, what we're doing. Um, or they can read an excerpt of it. And I'll say, so um, what do you think of this Monsieur Bobo guy? And they'll say, he is, he is, he is, he is a nasty, nasty, nasty man. I'll say, how do you know? And then they'll start talking and they'll have to go into the text. They'll have to show me, you know, um, some of the comments he made, the grin he made, um, the look in his eye, all those sort of clues that both in the text and in the pictures that Mr. Rebeau is not a nice guy. And then I can talk to them about making inferences. That's them doing the work without me having to do much other than give them a good piece of text. Um, our math colleagues have this down. Um, some of the 
best mathematic lessons I've ever seen in the world are when um, a teacher before the lesson is actually carefully crafted a problem that embodies the objectives that she's going to teach that day. And so she writes the problem on the board and she says to the kids, okay, have at it. They all stare at her. Some of them stare at their paper and they start to get started and they, they make an attempt. And then she says, okay, after a few minutes, she says, um, uh, what, are some, what are some of the things you thought? And they share some of their thinking and she says, okay, she didn't say anything after that. She says, okay, what I want you to do now is I want you to turn to your partner. I want you to do it again, but do it with your partner and compare your work and see who you think is more um, in line with what the problem needs um, and see if you can't, you know, further, further thinking along. And so the kids tackle it. Um, and then, and then, um, and then it's not until they do that, that then she starts to have them share answers publicly. And then they can agree and disagree about whether or not this partnership is sort of had an answer that's closer to, and they can look at each other's evidence. And it's not to the end when the teacher say, can say, so how do we know which answer is right? And how do we know which work the kid that students did to best support that evidence? And they do that work. And then the teacher has had a chance to watch where the kids are struggling, what mathematical principles need to be built up, and where some direct teaching needs to happen. So then when she has to do the talking, she can do it very directly and very succinctly, which will allow her to, to, uh, to, uh, um, to have a, a lesson where the kids, she's not doing all the thinking, the kids are doing a ton of thinking. Because it's in their mistake making, right, that, that, that the learning occurs. It's in that sort of trial and error and that we need kids to engage with. Um, but that, of course, doesn't happen if kids aren't motivated. So the last bullet, or the last box, if you will, um, uh, of the stool of the collaborative classroom is, um, is motivation. Um, and we can't, you know, I, I, I can maybe cajole a kid. Maybe I can, I can scare them into pay attention today. Um, but in the end, over the course of a year, if kids are going to do the work, if they're going to work with me, they're going to build relationships with me, they got to want to do it. And it's all interrelated. I mean, the curriculum has to matter to them, right? They, they have to feel connected. They have to feel safe. Um, um, and uh, and that, 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 in fact, those things are the birthplace of, of, of intrinsic motivation. We often talk about, you know, um, uh, the ABCs, you know, that if, if a student has a sense of autonomy, if they feel a sense of belonging, connection, and they feel competent, they feel like they might be able to do it. Um, that, that that's actually the birthplace in a, a, lot of a lot of the literature backs this up of motivation. Um, my colleague Kathleen Cushman wrote a book called The Motivation Equation. Um, and and um, she came to a very similar conclusion where she looked at um, people who are experts in the field and she looked at kids and when kids were willing to sort of persevere through something, what made them want to do it? Um, and it was this idea that if they, if they felt like they could do it, and they felt that strong sense of connection with other people, they were able to sort of grow through it. And that was her motivation equation. Without it, we're sort of stuck. And um, the only other thing I would say about these four things is that it's true for us as well. So when I think of schools, and I think the way schools you know, support teacher professional learning, and how we construct learning experiences for teachers, all four of those things, you know, all four of these are true for kids, but they're also true for adults because they're true for learning. You know, we, as, as, as adults, need to feel safe. I need to be, if I'm going to be in a faculty room where I'm going to raise my hand and I'm going to, and I'm going to sort of share something I'm uncomfortable with, or I'm going to share something I don't know, or share something that, um, that I'm struggling with. I don't want to feel like my principal's going to call me out. I don't want to feel like my colleagues are going to sort of belittle me or they're thinking lower of me. And, you know, um, that's often done silently, you know. Um, and so I, I, people have to feel a deep sense of connection. If I'm a teacher, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to say, you know, hey, I'm struggling here. Could you help me? For me to say that, to be that vulnerable, it requires a deep sense of connection, just like it does with our students. 
And the same thing is true for, um, uh, uh, for uh, the interdependence. We need, we need the social skills to be successful. We need to be able to work with people that we don't necessarily agree with. I mean, how many times have we been in a faculty room and we, we just put our heads on and go, I can't believe she just said that. Like, that happens a lot, but we've got to work together. She may be in my grade level team. She may be at my, in my PLC. Like, how do I do that? How do I navigate that? Um, and so all these, things, these skills are, are, are really, really interdependent. And I'll close um, with this thing that I've been writing a lot about now. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about sort of the teacher stance. And um, this comes from really thinking about, um, I, I, I spend a lot of time um, coaching. And uh, when I work with young athletes, um, one of the things we teach them, you know, is different stances or poses. And if you're a dancer or a musician, you learn them as well. You know, if you're a violinist, you learn how to hold the bow, there's a certain stance, a certain posture, a certain way you present yourself. So there's a physical stance, but there's also a mental stance. There's also a mental stance you bring this with, like um, as you try to read a game, for instance, you're to anticipate what's coming next. And so I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean for a teacher stance? Like, so if I was gonna get better as a teacher, how do I, how do I teach in this way? Because in my experience, it's, it's not about just going to adopt an SEL program or adding social skills to my curriculum. I actually feel like I need to think about teaching and learning slightly differently. And that I need a new stance. And that, that when I adopt a new stance, I don't have to think about adding anything. It's to the way in which I am. Um, and so um, I think uh, about this um, in a few ways. And so one is that, um, one is that in a teacher stance, it's fundamental that we build relationships. And I think an intentional focus on relationships um, is, as you've heard me already talk about, is something that is profound in our, in, in our own practice. Um, I think even with young teachers and young, meaning new, maybe new teachers, so they're not necessarily young, but they're new to the profession. Um, it's the first thing that I work with them on because they're going to, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to mess up both with parents. They're going to mess up and they're going to mess up with their students. But when they mess up on a bed of a healthy relationship, it's a heck of a lot easier to it's a heck of a lot easier to recover. So relationships are fundamental to that. I also need to learn how to listen. And I think listening is actually a teaching skill. I think it's something that I know in, in a lot of the pre-service pro, pre programs that I work with, um, they don't teach listening. <laughs> so you don't take a class in listening. Um, but if you were to go to a, uh, a relationship counselor, <laughs> if you were to go to a marriage counselor, um, and they were to look at uh, a relationship, probably one of the first things that they would help us work on is our ability to listen to one another. Um, and so um, if I'm gonna be a good teacher, I've gotta be a good listener. Um, I also need to, to be a good watcher, good kid watcher. Um, uh, the Goodmans have a book um, called Kid Watching, uh, which is a great book and it's got a lot of great tools, uh, data collection tools as we observe student thinking and behavior. But um, it's an old book, but uh, some of you have been around a long time, maybe, maybe, maybe remember it. Um, but observing closely is, I think, is a fundamental piece of a teacher's stance. And then I've already talked about constructing learning experiences. I think it, it, it's a different way, it's a different stance with planning lessons and designing lessons. So I'm not just planning content, I'm actually planning experiences. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm planning for engagement. So I'm gonna plan for how kids are gonna interact with, with one another. I'm not just looking at what I'm gonna cover. And, and I need to value student thinking um, more than the right answer, more than the right answer. So what I mean by that is a, a student might often say to me, um, they raise their hand and they would give me an answer. And oftentimes if it's the right answer, we would move on. So thank you. We'd say, great, great answer. Um, and I'm going to suggest that, that, that what we really need to value isn't the answer they gave us. It's why they thought that. I want kids to have to justify their thinking whether they gave me the right answer or the wrong answer. I want them to recognize that what I value is the work they're doing to give me the answer, not the answer itself. The answer is important, but just to a point. And I learned this really from Eleanor Duckworth. If you haven't read her book, The Having of Wonderful Ideas, it's probably a book that I return to over and over and over again. I often cite it. Um, but she's got a chapter in that book called The Virtues of Not Knowing. And 
Um, and, and that's really where I learned this idea, this idea that it's the thinking that kids are doing that matter most. And our stance has to be one where kids recognize that that's what we're going for. Because kids are like little piranha. They will leech on to the right answer. They are looking, they're scanning, looking, because they want to be right, they want to be validated. That's true for a senior in high school, and that's true for a five-year-old. They want to be validated, they don't want to be wrong. Um, and if what they learn that I value is the thinking, is the risk taking, it's the use of evidence to justify your thinking. It's going on a limb and saying, you know, I think the author's trying to say blank. And then someone else saying, actually, I disagree. I think, I think the author meant this, and this is the line that told me that. Then I go back to that first student and I say, so now what do you think? And if they heard a better piece of evidence, I want to hear them say, yeah, you know, I, um, I think that may be right. And that makes me think, and they can add on to it. Or they might say, I disagree. I think you're reading the evidence wrong. Here's another piece of detail that, may, that you left out of your answer, and it's why I actually feel stronger in my opinion now. So valuing student thinking, when we value, that's the kind of interaction we get from students. And then finally, we want to facilitate, which is embedded in some of the things I just said, and we want to reflect. We often get very little chance to be reflective as teachers. I used to, you know, I, I remember um, I, I used to uh, keep a little notebook and I used to have this thing that at the end of every day I, I would, um, my goal was to write down and just spend like 20 minutes just thinking about what went well that, that day, what didn't go well, what, what do I want to think about for tomorrow. And I don't know that I ever had, I ever like did that. <laughs> it was always, you know, trying to put out a fire. Um, a parent was at the door. Um, there was always something happening. Um, and, and it's hard to eke out time to be reflective. Um, but it's been, in my mind, in, it's, it's really key to a teacher's stance. So um, that's what I had today. Um, I'll open it up for questions. And if people want to connect with me as we move uh, on, you can find me at thecollaborativeclassroom.org. Um, or you can be on Facebook and you can find me in, um, or you can find me at Twitter. So um, you can chat me up any way you want. And Mary, I'll just turn it over to you and see what questions people had. So Peter, uh, we have some wonderings about intrinsic motivation. You mentioned the ABCs, autonomy, belonging, and competence, and, and building on those to build intrinsic motivation. But um, our friend Wendy said, Intrinsic motivation is the $64,000 question. How do you build on that? How do you get that from kids? Yeah, um, so I'll give you my, I mean, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, I think that it, because I think the answer is it's the three of them interdependently. It's so it is, it is actually a kid has to feel a strong sense of connection. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. So in my experience, um, especially kids who struggle, or kids who find school challenging, um, that uh, that oftentimes they find that you know that that it's not often the kids who do really really well in school that act out. I mean, it happens sometimes, but it's not traditionally true. Um, I mean, the school to prison pipeline is is sort of littered with kids who sort of are misbehaving so much that they get excluded from from classroom and eventually they drop out. Right? I mean, that that's heavily documented. So um, kids traditionally who uh, who are uh, less motivated, um, and that's strongly correlated, correlated with kids who have a, a very um, low a sense of connection to school, and low sense of connection to the adults in school, and probably to their classmates. Um, and so part of, in my experience, where I've worked in communities where we've really, really attacked this, um, we've started with building relationships. I think, you know, I, I can get kids sometimes, if they think I have their best interest at heart, if they fundamentally trust me and they built a relationship with me, if I say, I just need you to do this today. I know it's hard. I know you don't want to do it, but I need you to do it. If they have a strong relationship, sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes that's enough. Um, <clears throat> it's not enough to sustain it over time because eventually they have to feel competent and they have to feel like it's important, right? Um, but, uh, but it's in that relationship that I think the truth comes out. It's when I can find what matters to them. I can find, um, the sort of ways in which to help them find themselves in the work. Um, and I think that that's the hard work. That's why it's hard with a big class. 
but it, that's why I think relationships and the way we structure our learning experiences are so important. Because if the curriculum is irrelevant to kids, if I'm teaching in a way where they're passive and they're quiet, and I don't have a strong relationship with them, and they don't have a strong relationship with, with each other, then it's sort of a recipe for disengagement. And then typically the only kids that do opt in tend to be affluent kids, tend to be white kids who have bought into the system. And, they aren't, they, and so they sort of know that something's waiting for them on the outside after school. They know that they just have to get through this. And so they, are, they bought in, um, even if like this lesson is boring for them. They go through the motions of school. But when kids feel disconnected, they don't feel like there's anything out there for them. They don't feel like there's anything after. Um, and they feel a strong sense of disconnection that work is so much harder. And I don't know if that, that's a, that's a long-winded way of answering. It's how I think about it, but it's not easy. And I don't have like, there's no magic bullet. There isn't a, a piece of Advil or a, it's not like I can take a piece of Advil and have my headache go away. Like I, there's no secret way to get kids motivated, but I do think it starts with connection. Yeah, I, th I think so too. And, you know, I think when you, <laughs> how you set up those four core principles are the, you know, the four legs of that stool. But I think the, 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 the three-legged stool of the ABCs is having those relationships and yet giving kids choice. I think that autonomy piece plays into it as well. When kids can choose uh, yes. books that they're going to read or choose what they're going to write about. Yeah, I think that's sort of related into the curriculum itself. I mean, that's why when I think the curriculum has to be relevant, it has to be, they have to find themselves in it and they have to feel like they have some control over it, you know, and, um, and it doesn't mean they have control over everything because, you know, we've got topics we have to cover. I get that. But within those topics, there's a way in which we can engage kids in the learning um, and we have to help them see um, why that might be important, but they can only do it if they trust us. You know, if they don't trust me, I could do, I could be the greatest teacher in the world. I could have the greatest learning experiences in the world. But if I don't have a, a deep connection with them, it's, it's going to be really hard. And I will tell you that the kids who need that connection the most, as you all know, probably, they're the hardest kids to build those relationships with. Because um, they, they, they've got all kinds of challenges, right? Some of them are kids of trauma. They've got, they've got their own issues. Um, some of them have disabilities. Some of them are just um, uh, in situations that haven't, that, you know, where they haven't learned the most productive skills. Um, and, uh, uh, and we're in there and they're, and so they're harder for us to engage with. Um, you know, the, our biggest discipline problems are the kids that, that make it hard to like, um, but it's in liking them and in finding the ways in which we can connect with them that I think where the answer lies. Um, and, but it's the hardest work because I think they can often be the kids that are hardest for us to connect with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And so much of what you've talked about today, Peter, the whole idea of listening and all the things that you've brought forward does all seem to tie together that you need all of that. We, we ask a lot of our teachers, don't we? But they it is all of that it is all in that stance that you talked about so thank you for that that some good thinking that's brought forth you also struck a chord with the sweetest pig we have some fans of that book so thanks for the ideas on what you could do with that that's great um kehlani i'm going to ask to see if you want to come on and have any uh words with us here as we're coming close to a close well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for those who participated. I just want to um, let you know that this is uh, the second. We have another webinar in the series that Mary will be talking about. And this has been recorded. So if you want to come back later and listen or share it with your colleagues, it will be posted. Um, you can also get information. The last uh, slide, Mary, can you pull up the slides um, so they can see the contact information and then uh, an overview? So we've got uh, my my email uh, and Mary's email, um, and where uh, you can go to our website, uh, the Literacy Organizational Capacity Initiative or the Consortium for Educational Change, and find out more information about the resources around social emotional learning um, and the archive of this webinar. So thank you for attending. And Mary, do you want to give a little bit of information about the, uh, the next webinar that's upcoming? Yes, so coming up on March 13th, we're going to hear from Dr. Joshua Cole. He's the principal at Ecoff Elementary School in Chester, Virginia. 
where they're doing a lot of work with social emotional learning and following a lot of what Peter's talked about today. And he's going to talk a little bit about how they've made that happen and how they're leveraging social emotional learning to create equity in the classroom and across the school. So please mark it on your calendar. Um, and we'll be sending out notifications about that if you I'm not sure how many of you found out about this today, but we will continue to um, send things out if you are on the CEC mailing list. Otherwise, you could email Kehlani or you could email me at, at the addresses you see here and we can get you the information about this. And could I just echo your gratitude to Peter Brunn from Collaborative Classroom, who just has made us all think a little bit deeper about what we're going to do when we walk back into our classrooms tomorrow. So thank you, Peter. And thanks, Kehlani, for the opportunity to bring us all together. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.